So today I am very, very excited um, to welcome our host, uh, Udo Diri Okwandu. Um, and really, this is our first, again, like I said, this is our first webinar in our science and social justice series uh, entitled The History of Scientific Racism and Why It Matters for STEM Educators, hosted again by Udo Diri Okwandu, who is a PhD student in the history of science at Harvard University. Uh, so Udo Diri, um, love to welcome you to the stage. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, and so I will start by uh, briefly reading uh, Udo Diri's bio, and after that we will transition into her lecture. Um, so Udo Diri R. Okwandu is a doctoral student in the History of Science Department and Presidential Scholar at Harvard University. She speaks widely on the history of medicine to shed light on health disparities and social inequality and to promote justice. She's particularly interested in the ways in which scientific and medical inquiry have been deployed by the state to manage and control marginalized populations. As such, her work critically examines science and medicine's relationship to power and their ability to enact subjection. Her current work examines the intersection and constructions of race, reproduction, and psychiatric health in the United States and how they undermine the concept of citizenship for Black Americans. In her spare time, Udo Diri enjoys trying out new recipes, attending concerts, fitness, and writing poems. So thank you again, Udo Diri, for joining us today for this webinar. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure um, to be here um, and to have the space to talk about these issues that are very um, important to me. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen so that we can get started. Great. Um, so again, yes, my name is Udodiro Kwandu, um, and today we're going to be talking about um, the history of scientific racism and why it matters for STEM educators. Um, I guess to preface, it's important to highlight that this is not an exhaustive history. Um, it is not a complete history, but it just aims to be a kind of an early exposure to some of these critical issues within this field um, and hopefully can open up for more exploration. So with that, I'm going to get started. It's not uncommon to hear 2020 be described as the year of America's racial reckoning. The high profile killings of Black Americans George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery called attention to not only police brutality and racially motivated violence against Black and Brown communities, but also to systems, institutions, and behaviors that uphold white supremacy and inequality in our nation. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, specifically Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic communities as a consequence of longstanding failures in healthcare and public health that have increased their risk for infection, severe illness, and death. Finally, increased attention has been placed on the human rights and health violations committed by the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement against migrants. Most recently, it was revealed that immigrant women detained at a privately run detention center in Georgia underwent gynecological procedures such as hysterectomies without fully understanding or consenting to them. As a result of our current historical moment, educators and their students are now finding themselves engaging in new and at times difficult conversations. Students may be wondering how as a society we have gotten to a place where injustice, discrimination, and racism are so commonplace. On the other hand, educators may be reflecting on how they can effectively teach about race and racism in their classrooms. 2020 has indeed been a racial reckoning. However, it is long overdue. The reality is racism is woven into the fabric of society and has left no part untouched. Even scientific and medical disciplines that have historically been and continue to be conceptualized as neutral, objective, and apolitical. In recent decades, the fusion of race, medicine, and science has been assumed to be for the best of intentions. However, a historical analysis reveals how race-based scientific and medical practices can perpetuate discriminatory ideologies, 
practices, and behaviors. It is critical that STEM educators recognize that much of modern Western scientific knowledge cannot be divorced from the context of slavery, colonialism, and global imperialism under which it was produced, a context that ultimately shaped racism and discrimination that we see in our own society. Scientific racism describes how the authority of science can be used both consciously and subconsciously to justify inequalities between natural groups of people and notions of racial superiority and inferiority. Medical racism, which can be viewed as a consequence of scientific racism, refers to prejudice and discrimination in medicine and the healthcare system based upon an individual's race. Central to both scientific and medical racism is the use of race as a legitimate analytic, analytical category. Conventionally, a race is understood as individuals who have common origins that result in biologically transmitted physical, mental, and cultural traits. The problem with this formulation, however, is that it assumes that racial categorizations are universal and natural. The reality is that when we identify and label people as a particular race, we are referring to groups of humans separated by artificial boundaries that change depending on time, geography, and sociopolitical context. As such, I find it more useful to view race as an ideology that reflects the narratives that individuals construct to understand their social reality and signifies and symbolizes social conflicts and interests by referring to different types of human bodies. This makes race an unstable category and helps explain how the construction of racial identities have been imposed to maintain unequal power dynamics and reinforce the oppression of the historically dominated. I believe that it is particularly important for STEM disciplines to view race as a subjective ideological form formulation because it helps us realize that many scientific facts are actually the product of social decisions. While science is understood to be objective and neutral, it is critical to keep in mind that science is carried out by real people who operate in the social world. As a result, the types of questions that are or are not asked, the way that data is or is not analyzed, and how we choose to or not to apply scientific knowledge is ultimately a reflection of sociopolitical, economic, cultural, and moral considerations. In other words, science and medicine have affected the production of race, and race has affected the production of science and medicine. This does not mean that all science is inherently bad or untrue. The many societal advances that have come from STEM are indisputable. However, just because science works, that does not mean that we should not interrogate and challenge the authority granted to it to understand and shape our social world. As science educators, you are all uniquely positioned to have these conversations with students, demonstrate how STEM and STEM institutions have and continue to perpetuate racism and inequality, and help take the necessary actions to reverse this trajectory. As such, the remainder of this presentation will spotlight three case studies that examine how race has been used in STEM in the past and present, and how it has perpetuated racism, inequality, and oppression in society. The first will investigate the concept of race in the biological sciences. The second will examine racism in medicine and public health. And finally, the third will discuss how modern technologies can perpetuate racial inequality.
practice. Beginning in the 18th century, physicians and scientists in Europe and the United States discussed and attempted to define racial difference, largely in an attempt to justify the existence of slavery, slavery in the Americas, the colonial system, and global imperialism. During this period, scientists struggled to reconcile Christian theology, which asserted that all humans were descended from Adam and Eve, and scientific knowledge when it came to the question of the origins of man. From this question stem two dominant schools of thought, monogenesis and polygenesis, both of which reinforced the idea that non-white subjects, particularly black and brown communities, were savages and racially, intellectually, and physically inferior. Monogenesis posits a common descent for all humans. However, it still asserted that there were distinct racial types due to the unequal distribution of sin after the Great Flood. Polygenism, on the other hand, argued that varieties of humans have different origins. For example, Harvard biologist Louis Agassiz argued that Black people were created along with other beasts and animals in the Garden of Eden. Throughout this period, attempts were made on both sides to support their theories and racial difference and the inferiority of non-white races more generally with scientific and anthropological evidence. For example, physician and natural scientist Samuel G. Morton argued that he could define the intellectual ability of a race by examining their skull. In his 1839 book, Crania Americana, Morton claimed that Caucasians have the a closer examination of Morton's work, however, makes it evidently clear that, Mark, that Morton was conducting biased research as he selectively reported data, manipulated sample compositions, made analytical errors, and mismeasured schools in order to support his prejudicial views on intelligence differences between populations. Morton's followers, Josiah C. Knott and George Glidden, continued his work with their books, Types of Mankind, and Indigenous Races of the Earth, published in 1854 and 1857. In Types of Mankind, they argued that the races of mankind did not operate from a single pair. Instead, they believed that the creator from the beginning made each race and positioned them in separate homelands to dwell in. They built upon this argument in Indigenous Races of the Earth where they linked anthropology and scientific studies of race to establish a supposed natural hierarchy of the races. For example, they implied that black people were a creational rank between white people and chimpanzees. The polygenesis and monogenesis debate was largely resolved by the 1870s as a result of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution which was published in his 1859 book on the origin of the species and elaborated upon in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man. Central to Darwin's evolutionary theory was the assertion that all humans shared common origins. However, while he argued for a monogenism of the human species, his notion of natural selection lent itself to polygenist arguments. Natural selection is the process through which populations of living organisms adapt and change as individuals with advantageous traits survive and reproduce. Over time, these advantageous traits become more common in the population and can give rise to new and distinct species. Evolutionary theory quickly became embedded in larger racial discourses. It was thought that Darwinian forces operated on culture allowing for a hierarchy of civilization that went from the, quote, dark-skinned savage to the civilized white man. For example, this 1899 political cartoon by Victor Gillum depicts two American men carrying alleged savage populations up a mountain. The bottom of the mountain includes labels such as barbarism, ignorance, and vice, while the top is labeled civilization. The people in the baskets are caricatures of non-white racial groups that were conceptualized as inferior during this time period. In addition, the cartoon suggests that the only way for these, quote, inferior groups to civilize is through the intervention of white men, as exemplified through the title of the political cartoon, The White Man's Burden. 
The biological sciences were used to legitimate and reinforce this racial hierarchy through the rhetoric of degeneracy. The idea that an individual could change from a more complex to a simpler form and that degenerate racial traits could be passed on generationally. In this context, race was a catch-all term that provided no clear line between the physical or biological and the cultural or social. The justification for racism transitioned from theological underpinnings to evolutionary ones, ultimately revealing how a number of philosophical and scientific arguments are deployed to justify unequal treatment. It is in this context that eugenics, the science of human heredity, emerged in the late 19th century. Eugenics is a set of beliefs and practices that aims at improving the genetic quality of a human population by controlling reproduction. Central to eugenics was the idea of biological determinism, which argues that physical, mental, moral, and behavioral defects such as poverty, criminality, alcoholism, and bearing children out of wedlock to be unalterable inherited traits. While eugenics professed to be about improving genetic quality, in practice it aimed to preserve the position of dominant white groups in society, ultimately through the genocide of those deemed less fit. As such, the targets of eugenics were those seen as unfit for society, the poor, the mentally ill, and specific communities of color including Black Americans, Hispanic people, and indigenous populations. These groups disproportionately fell victim to eugenicist sterilization initiatives. For example, from the 1930s to the 1970s, nearly one third of the female population in Puerto Rico was sterilized. The US and Puerto Rican governments justified compulsory sterilization by connecting the nation's poverty with overpopulation and the hyperfertility of Puerto Ricans. Black American women were most notably sterilized in Southern states. For example, from 1929 to 1974, the North Carolina Eugenics Board sterilized 7,600 people who were mostly Black and female. And 60% of Black female residents were sterilized at Sunflower City Hospital without their permission during the 1960s. Finally, an estimated 40% of indigenous women, approximately 60 to 70,000 women, underwent sterilization in the 1970s. In these cases, physicians failed to present potential alternatives and to explain the irreversible nature of sterilization and threatened that the refusal of the procedure would result in women losing their children and or federal benefits. Racial discourses painted these women as hyperfertile unintelligent, and ultimately translated into actions that dehumanized and abused them. While few people study or advocate for eugenics today, some scientists, particularly in the field of genetics, continue to hold on to related ideologies. Eugenics and genetics obviously differ in practice. Eugenics was largely state-directed and focused on exterminating particular traits and populations. While genetics is now embedded in a democratic consumer culture that allows individuals to leverage gene technologies in their own way. Ideologically, however, both are centered on a belief that human perfectibility is a necessary and beneficial ideal. Genetic engineering and editing technology like CRISPR has been applied to a variety of tasks in the past decade, including the removal of genes responsible for disease and destroying drug-resistant superbugs. These interventions are a critical advancement in the medical sciences. However, we must consider what it could look like if these technologies are used on genes that control who we are or what we look like. Finally, it is critical to keep in mind that race-focused research continues to live on with the terms population and human variation rather than races and racial differences using these terms as a crude proxy for myriad of social and environmental factors. For example, in their 2012 article, Do Pigmentation and the Melanocordin System Modulate Aggression and Sexuality in Humans as They Do in Other Animals? J. Philippe Rushton and Donald I. Templer argue that within human populations and between populations, 
darker pigmented people average higher levels of aggression and sexual activity and also have lower IQ. To substantiate their claim of the relationship between pigmentation and violence, the authors compare people of African descent with those of European descent and observe whether darker skinned individuals average higher levels of aggression. They found that black people are overrepresented in crime statistics relative to whites and Asians. The problem with relying on crime statistics, however, is that it fails to take into account that black people are disproportionately arrested, prosecuted, convicted, and incarcerated as a consequence of a largely anti-black criminal justice system. Groupings by race, even if the term race is not explicitly used, are dangerous because they reinforce the notion of inherent biological differences. Instead, it is critical to consider the many forms of institutional, structural, and interpersonal racism that are ignored in favor of using race as an analytic. This is particularly relevant when considering our second case study, racism in medicine and public health. In the United States, Black, Indigenous, and non-white Hispanic people continue to have the worst outcomes on a majority of examined measures of health status, are more likely to be uninsured, face significant disparities in access to and utilization of care, and receive lower standards of care. While this data shows us that people of color continue to face significant disparities in the healthcare system, it fails to reveal its origins. The fact of the matter is that the historical proliferation of ideas about non-white subjects' biologically-based inferiority has left these groups vulnerable to racist, scientific, and medical discourses, unethical experimentation, and exploitation that manifest in contemporary racial discrimination and health disparities. For example, a 2016 study found that many white medical students incorrectly believed that black people have higher pain tolerance than white people. Racialized interpretations of the nervous system in the 18th and 19th centuries, more specifically that black nerves were thicker and therefore less sensitive, led to the conclusion that black people felt less pain than whites. The proliferation of this belief has led to the persistent failure to acknowledge the severity of and denial of equitable pain relief for Black patients' pain. This history is particularly relevant when we consider the current COVID-19 pandemic that has tragically resulted in nearly 220,000 deaths in the United States. In a statement published on July 24, 2020, the Centers for Disease Control notes that long-standing systemic health and social inequities have put many people from racial and ethnic minority groups at increased risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. Racially biased interpretations of pain have also contributed to these disparities. For example, preliminary research by Boston-based biotech firm Rubix Life Sciences found that Black people who visited hospitals with COVID-19 symptoms were six times less likely to get treatment or testing than white patients. This trend is unsurprising when one considers that studies have consistently found that doctors downplay Black patients' complaints of pain, give them weaker pain medication, and even withhold life-saving interventions, such as cardiac treatments, when they need them as a result of ingrained assumptions, cultural ignorance, or hostile attitudes towards Black people. Given that Black patients enter the healthcare system with distinct disadvantages, biased medical treatment can be particularly fatal. Racial bias is even embedded in medical instruments that are portrayed as producing objective measures. Take, for example, the spirometer, a medical instrument that measures lung capacity and is commonly used across the world for the diagnosis and management of many respiratory diseases. Despite there being great variability in lung function measurements over time, geographies, and groups, since the 1960s, much effort has been expended to standardize the many sources of variability. The consequence of this quest for standardization is the common practice of race correction or ethnic adjustment. Spirometers adjust for race by either using a scaling factor for all people not considered white or by applying population-specific norms. 
Race is often determined by either asking patients to self-identify or through the physician's own visual assessment. The notion that there are racial differences in lung capacity can be traced back to the early years of American slavery. For example, in his 1785 book, Notes on the State of Virginia, former President Thomas Jefferson argued that slavery was the best condition to improve the alleged poor lung function of enslaved Black people. Drawing explicitly on Jefferson's interpretive framework, plantation physician and slaveholder Samuel Cartwright built his own spirometer in the 19th century to study and quantify differences in lung capacity in enslaved people and whites. He ultimately concluded that deficiencies in black people's lung capacity was 20% when compared to white people. Defining difference as a deficiency continues to be a key organizing principle of lung function measurement in the United States today. As for black people, a normal spirometer reading is reduced by approximately 12%. The consequences of this practice are that Black people are subject to a different normal and have to demonstrate more lung damage before receiving effective treatment. Racialized conceptions of pain and lung capacity are just two examples of how race becomes institutionalized in medicine and science. Institutionalized racism consists of the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. It can be seen or detected in processes, attitudes, and behavior which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping which disadvantage minority ethnic people. Part of the process of addressing these ongoing disparities will involve re-examining incomplete, misleading, or ignored historical narratives that contribute to their development. Our final case examines how racism can become embedded in technology. In the United States, it is a common myth that disciplines such as mathematics, computer science, and engineering are culturally and politically neutral and objective. This statement cannot be further from reality. While we increasingly live in a technology and data-driven world, it is critical to keep in mind again that this world is enabled by people who ask subjective questions that result in subjective applications. Take, for example, the relationship between technology, surveillance, and policing. Racial inequality is evident in every stage of the criminal justice system from policing to prosecutorial decisions, pretrial release processes, sentencing, correctional discipline, and even reentry. For example, in the United States, indigenous youth are three times more likely than white youth to be held in a juvenile detention facility. Black and non-white Hispanic people are disproportionately stopped on the street by police, arrested, and experience the use of force. These racial disparities in the criminal justice system are presently being exacerbated by policing technologies that disproportionately target black and brown communities. For example, risk assessment tools have spread across the United States as part of efforts to scrap or minimize the use of cash bail to decide who is imprisoned or sent home while awaiting trials. The logic behind these tools was that because a single judge is subject to personal biases, greater objectivity in these cases could be achieved by combining human judgment with mathematical formulas based on statistics from past cases. The problem with these tools, however, are that they are often built on data that reflects racial and ethnic disparities in policing, charging, and judicial decisions problems that cannot be resolved with technical fixes. For example, a 2018 study in Kentucky found that after risk assessment tools were introduced, white defendants were offered no bail release much more often than black people. A 2019 study in Virginia found that judges overruled an algorithmic risk assessments recommendations most of the time and that racial disparities increased among circuits that used risk assessment the most. The use of discriminatory technology is not isolated to our criminal justice system, 
In her 2018 book, Algorithms of Oppression, Sophia Nova reveals how search algorithms such as Google perpetuate negative biases against women of color and other marginalized populations, while also affecting internet users in general by leading to racial and gender profiling, misrepresentation, and even economic redlining. For example, a 2017 study found that as a computer teaches itself English, it becomes prejudiced against Black Americans and women. The principles used to teach computers English come from cognitive science principles that focus on word association, or in other words, how often two words appear together. After conducting an implicit association test, it was found that African American names in the program were less associated with the word pleasant than white names. It's undeniable that technology has made many parts of life easier. However, that does not mean that it is always fair. Just as humans are error prone and biased, so too are the technologies, algorithms, and data that we use, because it is humans that make this technologically driven world possible. As demonstrated through these case studies, racist practices and behaviors continue to be manifested in science, technology, engineering, and medicine. This history is particularly critical for science educators who produce the next generation of leaders and innovators in STEM. First and foremost, it is critical that educators recognize that education is inherently political. Discussing the relationship between science, social inequality, and racism is just as political as choosing to discuss these topics as if they exist in isolation. Science educators are in a unique position to emphasize that scientific knowledge is an evolving, contested, and culturally mediated body of knowledge and set of practices that are deeply enmeshed with the human experience. One way that educators can do this is by historicizing and contextualizing the theories and practices that they teach. For example, educators can use the history of racism in science and medicine to challenge widely held beliefs and practices in their respective fields. In addition, educators can use STEM topics to teach and learn about contemporary issues related to social, economic, and racial injustice. There are many ways that students can benefit from this approach. First, they can recognize the power of science as an essential analytical tool to create a more equitable, equitable society rather than merely regarding science as a collection of disconnected rules and procedures to be memorized and regurgitated. In addition, they will be able to engage in high-level thinking about major principles and bodies of knowledge in STEM and participate in actual, not just theoretical, problem-solving projects. These are just a few ways that educators can work towards engaging in anti-racist pedagogy. Racism in science has a long and fraught history. However, my hope is that in making connections between our shared past, present, and future, we can recognize the dangers of relying on race-based investigations and promote a more equitable society. Knowledge is power. And as educators, we want to think critically about what sorts of ideologies and beliefs we want empowered in our world. The following are, are just a few resources that science educators can use to learn more about the history of racism in science and engage in anti-racist pedagogy. I'm grateful so much for your time and providing a space to share this critical and life-changing work. I hope this is just the beginning of the conversation. Thank you.